The bower was a Venetian-style palazzo, more like a private home than a hotel, lavish and opulent at every turn. His own wife, Caitlin, would have loved it, but he could never take her here or ever come back himself. Not after tonight and the unspeakable tragedy that was going to happen here in a matter of minutes, because that's what the butcher specialized in, tragedies, the unspeakable kind. He knew that there were ninety-seven guest rooms and eighteen suites in the bower, and that the Harrises were staying in one of the suites on the third floor. He followed them up the carpeted stairs and immediately thought, Mistake. But whose? Mine? Or theirs? He turned out of the stairwell, and it all went wrong in a hurry. The Harrises were waiting for him, both with guns drawn, and Martin had a nasty smirk on his face. Most likely they were going to take him to their room and kill him there. It was an obvious setup by two professionals. Not too shabby a job either. An eight out of ten. But who had done this to him? Who had set him up to die in Venice? Even more curious, why had he been targeted? Why him? And why now? Not that he was thinking about any of that now, in the dimly lit corridor of the bower with dueling guns pointed toward him. Fortunately, the Harrises had committed several mistakes along the way. They'd made following them too easy, they'd been careless and unconcerned, and too romantic, at least in his jaded opinion, for a couple married twenty years, even one on holiday in Venice. So the butcher had come up the stairs with his own pistol drawn, and the instant he saw them with guns out, he fired. No hesitation, not even a half second. Chauvinist pig that he was, he took out the man first, the more dangerous opponent in his estimation. He got Martin Harris in the face, shattered the nose and upper lip, a definite kill shot. The man's head snapped back, and his blonde hairpiece flew off. Then Sullivan dove, rolled to the left, and Marsha Harris's shot missed him by a foot or more. He fired again and got Marsha in the side of her throat. Then he put a second shot into her heaving chest and a third in her heart. The butcher knew the Harrises were dead in the hallway, just lying there like sides of meat, but he didn't run out of the bower. Instead, he whipped out his scalpel and went to work on their faces and throats. If he'd had the time, he would have stitched up the eyes and mouths, too, to send a message. Then he took a half dozen photographs of the victims, the would-be assassins, for his prized picture collection. One day soon, the butcher would show these photos to the person who had paid to have him killed and failed, and who was now as good as dead. That man was John Maggioni, Jr., the Don himself. Chapter 45 In his Michael Sullivan persona, he had the habit of thinking things through several times, and not just his hit jobs. The lifelong habit included things about his family, small details like how and where they lived and who knew about it. Also, images from his father's butcher shop in the Flatlands were always with him. An awning of wide stripes with the orange, white, and green of the Irish flag, the bright whiteness of the shop on the inside, the loud electric meat grinder that seemed to shake the whole building whenever it was turned on. For this new life of his, far away from Brooklyn, he had chosen affluent and mostly white-bred Montgomery County in Maryland. Specifically, he had picked out the town of Potomac. Around three on the afternoon that he arrived back from Europe, he drove exactly twenty-five miles an hour through Potomac Village, stopping, like any other good citizen, at the irritatingly long light at the corner of River and Falls Roads. More time to think, or obsess, which he usually enjoyed. So who had put a hit out on him? Was it Maggioni? And what did it mean to him and his family? Was he safe coming home now? One of the general appearances or disguises that he had carefully selected for his family was that of the bourgeois bohemian. The ironies of the lifestyle choice gave him constant amusement. 
non-fat butter, for example, and NPR always on the radio of his wife's trendy SUV, and bizarre foods like olive wheatgrass muffins. It was patently absurd and hilarious to the butcher. The joys of yuppie life that just didn't stop. His three boys went to the private Landor school, where they hobnobbed with the mostly well-mannered, but often quite devious, children of the middle rich. There were lots of rich doctors in Montgomery County, working for NIH, the FDA, and Bethesda Naval Medical Command. So now he headed out toward Hunt County, the ritzy subdivision where he lived. And what a private hoot that was. Hunt County, home of the hunter. And finally, there was his home, sweet home, purchased in 2002 for $1.5 million. Six large bedrooms, four and a half baths, heated pool, sauna, finished basement with media room. Sirius Satellite Radio was the latest rage with Caitlin and the boys. Sweet Caitlin, love of his straight life, who had a life coach and an intuitive healer these days, all paid for by his dubious labors on the hunt. Sullivan had called ahead on his cell, and there they were on the front lawn to meet and greet, waving like the big happy family that they thought they were. They had no idea, no clue that they were part of his disguise, that they were his cover story. That's all it was, right? He hopped out of the caddy, grinning like he was in a fast food commercial, and sang his theme song, the old Shep and the Limelight's classic, Daddy's Home. His life was the best, wasn't it? Except that somebody was trying to kill him now. And of course there was always his past. The way he grew up in Brooklyn, his insane father, the bone man, the dreaded back room at the shop. But the butcher tried not to think about any of that right now. He was home again. He'd made it. And he took a nice big bow in front of his family, who, of course cheered for their returning hero. That's what he was. Yeah, a hero. Part 3. Therapy Chapter 46 Alex! Hey you! How you been? Long time no see, big guy. You're looking good. I waved to a petite, pretty woman named Melina Freeman and kept on running. Melina was a fixture in the neighborhood, kind of like me. She was around the same age as I am and owned the newspaper store where the two of us used to spend our allowances on candy and soda when we were kids. Rumor had it that she liked me. Hey, I liked Melina too. Always had. My flapping feet kept me headed north on 5th Street like they knew the way, and the neighborhood scrolled by. Toward Seward Square, I hung a right and took the long way around. It didn't make logical sense to go that way, but I didn't do it for logical reasons. The news about Maria's murderer was the one thing holding me back these days. Now I was avoiding the block where it had happened, and at the same time working hard to remember Maria as I had known her, not as I had lost her. I was also spending time every day trying to track down her killer, now that I suspected he was still out there somewhere. I turned right on 7th, then headed toward the National Mall, pushing a little harder. When I got to my building at Indiana Avenue, I eked out just enough wind to take the four flights up, two steps at a time. My new office was a converted studio apartment, one large room with a small bath and alcove kitchen off to the side. Lots of natural light streamed in through a semicircle of windows in the turreted corner. That's where I'd set up two comfortable chairs and a small couch for therapy sessions. Just being here got me pretty excited. I'd put out my shingle and I was ready to see my first patient. Three stacks of case files were waiting on my desk, two from the Bureau and another sent over from DCPD. Most of the files represented possible consulting jobs. A few crimes to solve? An occasional dead body? I guess that was realistic. The first file I looked at was a serial case in Georgia, someone the media had dubbed the Midnight Caller. 
three black men were dead already, with a successively shorter interval between each homicide. It was a decent case for me, except for the 600 miles between D.C. and Atlanta. I set the file aside. The next case was closer to home. Two history professors at the University of Maryland, perhaps intimately involved, had been found dead in a classroom. The bodies had been hung from ceiling beams. Local police had a suspect, but wanted to work up a profile before they went any further. I put that file back on my desk with a yellow sticker attached. Yellow for maybe. There was a knock on my door. It's open, I called out, and immediately became suspicious, paranoid, whatever it is that I am most of the time. What had Nana said when I'd left the house earlier? Try not to get shot at. Chapter 47 Old habits die hard. But it wasn't Kyle Craig or some other psychotic nutcase from my past come to visit. It was my first patient. The visitor took up most of the doorway where she now paused as if scared to come in. Her face was turned down at the mouth, and her hand gripped the jam while she tried to catch her breath, while keeping some dignity. You putting in an elevator any time soon? She asked between gasps. Sorry about all the stairs, I said. You must be Kim Stafford. I'm Alex Cross. Please, come in. There's coffee, or I can get you water. The very first patient of my new practice finally lumbered into my office. She was a heavyset woman, in her late twenties, I guessed, though she could have passed for forty. She was dressed very formally, in a dark skirt and white blouse that looked old but well-made. A blue and lavender silk scarf was carefully tied under her chin. You said on the machine that Robert Hatfield referred you? I asked. I used to work with Robert on the police force. Is he a friend of yours? Not really. Okay. Not a friend of Hatfield's. I waited for her to say more, but nothing came. She just stood in the middle of the office, seeming to quietly appraise everything in the room. We can sit over here, I prompted. She waited for me to sit first, so I did. Kim finally sat down herself, perched tentatively on the forward edge of the chair. One of her hands fluttered nervously around the knot in her scarf. The other was clenched into a fist. I just need some help trying to understand someone, she began. Someone who gets angry sometimes. Is this someone close to you? She stiffened. I'm not giving you his name. No, I said. The name isn't important. But is this a family member? Fiancé. I nodded. How long have you two been engaged? Is that all right to ask? Four years, she said. He wants me to lose some weight before we get married. Maybe it was force of habit, but I was already working up a profile on the fiancé. Everything was her fault in the relationship. He took no account for his own actions. Her weight was his escape hatch. Kim, when you say he gets angry a lot, can you tell me a little more about that? Well, it's just... She stopped to think, although I'm sure it was embarrassment and not a lack of clarity that held her back. Then tears purled at the corners of her eyes. Has he been physically violent with you? I asked. No, she said a little too quickly. Not violent, it's just... Well, yes, I guess so. With one shaky breath, she seemed to give up on words. Instead, she untied the scarf around her neck and let it float down into her lap. I hated what I saw. The welts were easy enough to make out. They ran like blurred stripes around her throat. I'd seen those kind of striated markings before. Usually, they were on dead bodies. Chapter 48 I had to remind myself, the murders are behind you now. This is just a therapy session. Kim, how did you get those marks on your neck? Tell me whatever you can. She winced as she tied the scarf back on. If my cell phone rings, I have to answer it. He thinks I'm at my mother's house, she said. 
A terrible look crossed her face, and I realized it was too early to ask her about specific incidences of abuse. Still not looking at 